Hey, welcome to Atlee Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us for today's service, no matter where you find yourself on your spiritual journey. Just to let you know a little bit about Atlee, Atlee is a safe place for those who've given up on church or never went. And our mission is simple, to reach seekers and equip believers to love God, love themselves, love others, and serve the world. Now, if you want more information about who we are as a church or ways for you to get connected, make sure to check out our website at atleychurch.org, or you can also visit us on social media or download our app. And we hope today that you find the service helpful and also encouraging no matter where you are in life right now. So let's get started with today's service. I have never served a church where I would, where I could pick my own walk-up music before. I, now, now in a baseball setting, I've always thought if I was, you know, if I was a baseball player and I was going to be walking up to the plate, I would choose something maybe fitting to my background. I'm from Wise County, Virginia, so I was thinking maybe I've got friends in low places. That probably would not work for a church setting. The other one I really like is Wild Thing again probably not appropriate for a church setting. Um, but it's kind of cool that the churches I have served in the past, my walk-up music was always Bill Gaither. So I didn't get a chance to choose that. Um, but it is uh, wonderful stuff, still the same. But I'm so glad to be here with you today. I am still Bethany's dad. Um, I was Bethany's dad when I was here last month. I'm still Bethany's dad. I am very proud of her. She is a wonderful young lady. Um, and uh, she, she's doing a good work here. Uh, I tell people, you know, my, my daughter is a full-time student minister at a church, and they say, oh, aren't you proud? And I say, no, I'm scared. <laughs> my goodness, she's 21 and doing a full-time ministry, and I, that's, that's hard stuff. Uh, but I'm so proud of her. She's doing a good job here, and uh, the baptisms were beautiful, and I'm just so glad that she has the opportunity to, to serve in such a way. Um, so allow, thanks for allowing me to come back and be with you, and uh, uh, looking forward to sharing with you again this morning uh, from Psalm 23. All right, so last time we did the first three verses of Psalm 23. I still say that this is the scripture that has possibly been read the most in all of history. Uh, it is, um, of course, from the Old Testament which makes it uh, newer than the New Testament, I mean, older than the New Testament, and, and it is, is a popular psalm from David's time up until now. So I still say this is maybe the most read uh, piece of literature ever. So I'll read the first three verses, and we'll review them real quickly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So to quickly uh, look at the themes of the first three verses, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. It's a relationship with him. Um, he maketh me to lie down. Uh, excuse me, I shall not want is provision. Uh, he makes me to lie down and leads me beside the still waters is both peace and comfort. Uh, he restores my soul, which means that we have a healing God. He leads me, which means he is a God who gives us direction and leadership. He gives guidance. And the last thing I told you uh, was that maybe the bury the lead here, the most important part is we're supposed to do all of this for his name's sake. People often ask, you know, what's the purpose of life? You know, why are we really here? And according to David in, in Psalm 23, the purpose of our life is to live it 
for his name's sake. So that's the purpose. Today we pick it back up uh, in uh, Psalm uh, 23, verse 4, and I'll read those last three verses, and then we'll go through those. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So once again, scriptures that we have heard uh, throughout our life, if you've been a church member, then you, you've heard those scriptures. If you've just lived in the United States as a, as a general person, you've heard those scriptures because uh, it, it is something that we talk about and we hear all the time. But today I want to break down some of the truths that are found in that scripture. First in verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That means that we, in our life, will have trials and testing. These people who, who, were, who were leading churches who were talking about the fact that, you know, if, if, you, if you work hard enough and you give enough, then you're going to be blessed and everything's going to be easy. They've never read this before. We're going to have trials. We're going to have difficulties. It is promised. And David, in the 23rd Psalm, the first part of verse 4, says, folks, you're going to face trials. Everything is not going to come easy. Regardless of, of your relationship with your Heavenly Father, things don't always go the way that you would like. You're going to face difficult, difficulty. Um, my daughter, Becca, who is with us today, so good to see Becca. Um, she woke up. So <laughs> she starts school in a, a little over a week, and she has an 8 o'clock class. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Calling her at 9 o'clock on Monday and saying, so how did it go? Um, but um, sometimes Becca will come to me, and she'll... She'll say, hey, Dad, you want to watch some murder? We watch true crime together. And so, so we sit down and we watch true crime about, you know, something that happened and how they go through all of the, uh, the background and try to figure out who, who committed the, uh, the assault. And, and I think that maybe that's something that we, are, that, that, that we do in our life uh, in, in 2022, that we're so familiar with things that go wrong and we just accept it, and that's something that happens. Um, but, but honestly, throughout your life, those, those trials and tribulations that come along, God is, is not punishing you. God is not trying to, 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 to hurt you. Even in those trials and tribulations that we're going to read later, he's with you. And he, he is there to champion you even in those dark times. We face difficulty, but we have a God who is always with us. Now, I faced a trial last week. We were on vacation. We go back to the same house in North Myrtle Beach. We used to live there. And a friend of ours has a house right across the road from the beach, and they give us a good deal. We go back there every, every year. And once we got settled... I realized that for the first time in six years, my body was passing a kidney stone that was going to cause me pain. That's not fun, especially on vacation. And, and I was just, you know, laying there uh, aching and wondering, God, why now? Why, why is this happening? But I don't think that God was up in heaven saying, oh, I want to ruin his day. I don't think that God was up in heaven saying, I want to do something to make his life difficult. My body just passed a kidney stone. And God wasn't trying to throw arrows at me. He wasn't trying to hurt me. It was just the situation of life. And all of us are going to go through trials and, and testing. 
But we have a God who's always with us. Jesus even promised this to his disciples. Before he sent them out to do ministry in his name, he said this in Matthew chapter 10. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. If he would have put in, 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 uh, in, in the newspaper back in Jerusalem a job description for a disciple that said that you are going to be sent out as sheep among wolves, nobody would respond. But he was being honest with his disciples. It's going to be hard. What I'm asking you to do as I'm, as I'm helping you to share me for the first time in the world, disciples, when you go out, it's going to be a challenge. Just as it was a challenge for the 12 back in the first century, it's a challenge for you today. It's going to be hard, but it's worth it. Then down in verse 22, he says, he goes on to encourage them with this. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus says, yeah, guys, people aren't going to want to hear it. People are going to reject what you have to say. But I'm calling you to continue to hold on and to endure to the end because when you do that, it's going to be so worth it. There's something so great at the end. But folks, I'm, I'm saying, yes, you're going to go through difficulty, but there's something greater at the end. And David, as he's writing this, he knows a lot about trials and, te and, and testing in his own life. If you read the story of David, he had great victories. He also had massive defeats. He knew the top, he knew the bottom, and he knew that God was going to be with him in those valleys. So David is warning his readers that this can be a difficult road, but there's hope always. The second thing, in the second part, says, um, I don't fear because you are with me. That is protection and faithfulness. We don't have to be fearful because we are never alone. Did you hear that? We don't have to be fearful because we're never alone. Our Heavenly Father is always by our side. He cares what's happening in our life. And he's there with us every step of the way. So we don't have to be fearful. Lord, I know that you're there and that you're protecting me. And Lord, I ask you to help me to be faithful to you always. Because evil will not win in the end. God is greater, and he is faithfully with us every step that we take, even in the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us as our protector and our faithful friend. The presidents have the, 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 special, the, the uh, secret service who, who watch over them. Men that we pay and we train as, as American citizens to, to be around our political leaders, our, our president especially. But in the 1980s, when I was a teenager, some crazy guy got close enough to Ronald Reagan to shoot him. Now, he had his, his special, uh, his Secret Service people all around him, but this nut, this guy who was completely out of his mind, managed to get close enough to shoot our president. So, so, so these guys who have been trained, these guys who are willing to, to give their life to protect the president, when it came time for them to, to, to have that opportunity, they failed. And I think if, if you look at that from a, from a human standpoint, how can we be protected when the president who has people all around him, when he manages to get shot? And I think it's maybe difficult for us to believe that we can really be protected because we have seen so much violence and so much damage done but God's protection goes deeper. Yes, other men can cause us harm, but God protects us from within. 
and our Heavenly Father never takes a break. He's never not there. He's never on vacation. He's never taking a nap. He's always there for us, being our protector and being faithful to us. One of the most tragic things that have happened in our family, or in our a greater family, was when my son's uh, best buddy growing up, his name was Matthew, when Matthew was visiting with one of his friends after Christmas um, at his house at, on, a, on a day after school, and there happened to be a pr Christmas present, which was a rifle, just laying out on the bed. Matthew and this little fellow, this other friend, went in and started playing with it. The friend was holding it by the, by the trigger part. Matthew was on the other side. And the story is that Matthew grabbed the barrel and pulled, and he was shot. Matthew, 12 years old, died by that accident. And it's, it, was, it was devastating to us. It was devastating to his family. We were still close with them. And, and that's such a, such a tragic thing. The pastor who did the funeral, Joshua and I went back for the funeral. We were no longer living there then. But we went back for the funeral, and he made me so angry. He was talking about how all of us have an angel, and, and they're all around us to provide for our needs but that Matthew's angel on that day must have taken the day off. <laughs> I was in the congregation, and I've never wanted to yell out so much in my life. No! His angel was, it was a tragedy. Things happened that shouldn't have happened. The, the gun was on the bed. It was, wasn't protected. There was no lock on the gun. The kids were playing with it. Matthew pulled on the stock, and it went off. But his angel wasn't missing. His angel was with him as he laid there in that tragic circumstance. His angel was with him to take him home to be with Jesus when tragedy struck. God was still being faithful to Matthew even though something tragic had occurred. God didn't forget him or, take, or, or, or make his angel take a day off. He was with him all the way because, folks, bad things happen in our life. We live in a fallen world, but God never takes breaks. He is greater, and he holds us when difficult things happen to us, just as David promised that he would because God is our faithful protector always. The next part of the scripture says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's assurance. God always has what is needed to take care of his people. We can rest assured that God knows all about everything that's happening in our life. And he is there for us through it all. I think people feel better knowing that something is guaranteed. When you're sure that something will be taken care of, you're willing to invest in it. Now, I don't know all the ins and outs of this story, but I, I remember it uh, from, from just living through it. Kia Motors uh, is out of Korea. Uh, they were trying to get into the American market with their vehicles. And I remember when they were first making uh, headway in the United States, if you bought one of their nicer cars, they would throw in a, a Kia Rio for free. But man, how bad does a car have to be to give away a car when you, when you sell one? I thought, that's got to be a bad thing. But eventually, Kia realized that if they wanted to break into the American market, they had to do something different. So they decided that they were going to make all of their new cars have a warranty to 100,000 miles. The other automakers, if, you, if you've ever bought a new car, 36,000 maybe, 50,000. If, if someone's running a special, it may be 75,000. But Kia said, no, 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 no. 
we are going to guarantee our cars for 100,000 miles. We now own two of those. It feels good to know that the car that you have bought was made by someone who, who made it with the idea that it's going to last. And, and they have taken off in the United States. They're, they have become much more successful. And I suppose that they would have to, for them to be successful, their cars have to last 100,000 miles. Because if they were constantly being brought back, it would be a, be a loss on their part. But when people were, felt comfortable saying, wow, this is going to last me, they invested in it. You see, God has all the tools that he needs to take care of you. There is nothing in your spiritual engine that he can't fix. And God guarantees it. And his guarantee is much better than anything that Kia Motors can do. The fourth thing from the scripture today that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, which is deliverance. God always comes through for his people. God always gets the last word in everything. Oh, gosh. When, it, when, um, when Jennifer and I were first married, we've almost been married for 30 years now. It's hard to believe. Um, but when we were first married... Uh, we dreamed about having children, and we waited a while before Josh came along. And when our first one, Josh, came along, he's now 24, and he's a working actor. What an oxymoron that is. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, but when Josh came along, he was, he was so good. He was so easy. Josh, don't do that. Okay, Dad. I thought, man, we're going to have 50 children. This is so simple. Then Bethany came around. <laughs> and from the time she was, I don't know, six months old, she was going to get the last grunt. She wasn't making words yet, but she was going to get the last grunt. And she was, she was just so, you know, Bethany, don't touch that. <laughs> then Rebecca came along. And we'd say, Becca, don't touch that. And she said, oh, this? <laughs> it's, just, it's, a, it's the nature of, of, of human beings to, to, to not do the things that we're supposed to be doing. And, and it's, it's hard for, for us as parents to, to sometimes set those boundaries. But our God is a God who never... Let someone else get the last word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In the end, he has all control, and it's all under him, and no one is going to undo anything that he wants to have done. He is our deliverer. He always wins. We went to see um, my, my uh, niece, my wife's, sister's daughter uh, when we were first married and she wanted to play pool and she was explaining to me the, the billiards game that she played and she started off by saying, okay, first thing, I'm the winner. <laughs> she was an only child. Um, <laughs> but she, she, she had this mentality that before we start, I win. Folks, in reality, before God does anything, he's already won. Before he, he does anything, God is already right. And there's nothing that anyone can do to change that. He's already right. He already knows the answer. He's already moving to get things uh, where he wants them to be. We have been delivered by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have been delivered because we have a living Savior, one who loved us so much that he left heaven to come to earth to live out his life, to be the example for us, 
to, to pay the ultimate price by dying on the cross, and not just dying on the cross, but rising to new life so that we can have deliverance. And nothing that happens in this world can take anything away from the fact that we have been delivered. Revelation 1, uh, I want to read a little bit from that. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now, look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. In this book, those were written in red. You know why they're written in red? That's Jesus. Jesus has overcome. Jesus is alive and will forever be alive. And because he did that for us, he has the keys of death and hell. And nothing can take away the fact that you have been delivered by a living Savior. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have been delivered by a living Savior? We need, if we believe that, we need to live our life as though we have been delivered. The next point is, you anoint us my head with oil, which is consecration. To consecrate something means to declare it holy, taking something from the secular and sinful and making it holy and forgiven. God wants us to live consecrated lives. Our nature is not that way. Human nature is not to live consecrated lives. Now, when I was growing up, we had church clothes. My mom would buy church clothes for us regularly, and uh, it was myself and my younger brother. He was, he's six years younger than me, so we had a little bit different. So mom would get us ready, and then she would go in and she would get ready. I guess dad was always ready. Um, he just, he was dad, he was just ready. Um, but she would say, okay, you boys be good while I get ready. It took my mom a while. Perfection takes a while. My mom, you could smell her before you could see her. You could always hear her before you could see her. She was loud and proud. So she would go in and she'd get ready. And, and being boys, we would go outside and play basketball or, or do something. And those, those clothes that she had bought for me that were meant for something special and to, to be kept clean, way before we got to church, they were soiled and they were sweaty and they were no longer Sunday clothes. They were just clothes. And I think that's our nature, is to just, you know, I don't want to put in the effort. I don't want, I don't want to let God work in me and, 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 and do this, because I just, I just want to, you know, be me. But he's anointed you. He's consecrated you. He has set you aside to be blessed, to be special. He wants you to understand that and live into it. He wants you to, to, to know that he's called us to be people who strive to be holy and sacred, not because of what we are, because we're not holy and sacred, but because we serve a God who is holy and sacred. And he's anointed us consecrated us to live lives differently. And folks, when we do that, we should not apologize for it because he has consecrated us. Next part is that we have abundance. My cup runneth over. Now, that's not meant to say that the good shepherd gives us all kinds of worldly goods, but he blesses our lives with more than we could ever deserve or hope for. I think we don't understand abundance because in, in our culture, we, we are a culture of abundance. We don't understand how blessed we are. We don't see 
that blessing. I read an illustration not too long ago. Um, a little boy had read about the circus, and his greatest dream was to someday be able to go to the circus. He had read about it, and he had heard people talk about it, and he wanted to go, and he had told his dad this. And uh, eventually, a year later, there's flyers in town saying the circus is coming. And the boy goes to his dad and says, Dad, the circus is going to be here on this day, and it's a dollar. I don't know if I can, don't know if we can afford that. And the dad says, if you'll, if you'll promise to do your chores and to work hard between now and then, I'll make sure that you have the dollar to go to the circus. Truly enough, little boy works hard and, and does everything he can to impress his dad. And on the day of the circus, the dad hands him a dollar bill and he stuffs it in his bib overalls. It's the most money he ever had at one time. And he goes to town to see the circus. As he gets to town, there's a parade going on, the circus coming into town. The ringmaster's in the front with his baton and Behind him are these musical instruments making a loud noise that he had never heard before. He was amazed by the music they played. Behind them were all of the circus performers in their shiny costumes who were going to be doing death-defying things in just a matter of hours. And they walked and they pranced through town. He was amazed at them. Behind the performers were the animals, and the live animals, the Lion, and the, there was a lion tamer with a, with a whip and make, making uh, snapping noises to the roaring lions as it went by. And he was mesmerized by that. And at the very end, there were clowns who were handing out some candy and uh, reminders of the circus that was going to be taking place later that day. At the end of, the, of that, the little boy ran up to a clown put his hand in his suspenders and his bibs and gave the clown a dollar bill and said, that's everything I thought it would be, and headed home. He didn't realize that he had just seen a preview. He was happy with just the preview. There was so much more for him if he would have gone to the circus. But he was willing to accept just the little glimpse that he got. I think in our life that sometimes God has things prepared for us, things that he wants to, to show us, things that he wants to, to give, things he wants us to, to explore that we never get to because we're good with what we have. That we never take that next step to find out what God wants. But folks, our cup runs over and we need to be allowing God to show the fullness of what he has for us. The next promise from Psalm 23 is security. Surely goodness and mercy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, security's first. Um, so we're going to, we're secure in our Heavenly Father. We are secure in what he's able to do for us. We are safe in his arms. We know that he is there for us. Um, I'll go back to, to Grace in just a moment. So, um, God, our Heavenly Father, wants to make sure that we live a life of security. And I believe with all of my heart that you can know that, that you can have security. This is from John chapter 10. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Again, those are words in red in the Bible. That's Jesus. Those that have, who have accepted Jesus are now in his hand, and they cannot be snatched away. We are secure in him. He has done all he needs to do for us to find that security. But you have to be his to have that security. You have to know him. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have a relative who's always told me, oh, Russ, God wouldn't send his children to hell. And I say, yeah, but you've got to be his child. You've got to have a relationship with him. But once you have that relationship, you have security in Jesus Christ. And again, we need to live our lives secure. And I skipped grace. We'll go back to that. Grace is the unmerited gift 
of divine forgiveness by one loving God. You see, I'm sinful. I have fallen short of God's wants for my life, but he is my perfect shepherd. And he knows that I deserve punishment, but he loves me so much that he sent his son to pay the price for my sin so that I may experience his grace. Again, I think grace may be something that we have a hard time accepting in our, our world you don't see much grace. You don't see many people um, who are given that kind of mercy, that loving uh, uh, care, even though you don't deserve it. I think we're always trying to find a way to deserve things. And grace is something completely undeserved, given by a loving Father that we cannot pay back. There's a story about... Um, Mayor LaGuardia from New York City. Uh, the story goes that in December one year when he was governor, excuse me, when he was mayor, um, he went into the city court and he took over the night court for the judge. He was going to sit in and be the judge himself. And one of the cases that came before him was a, was a senior lady who had stolen bread. And the store owner said, she stole bread. There's, there's no doubt about that. I saw her. She admits it. She needs to pay me for the bread. LaGuardia looked down upon her and saw her desperate state. He said, okay, I, I fine her 50 cents to pay you back for the bread. But he said, what I want to do right now is I want to charge a tax to everyone who's in this room and I want it to be collected now. So everyone owes 50 cents. And so they, one of the bailiffs went around and collected 50 cents from everyone who was there. And he said, with the first 50 cents, I'm going to pay her fine. And then he took the other 40 some dollars and change and he gave it to the lady and he said, I know that you were only stealing to take care of yourself. And here's something to help you to take care of yourself. That's grace. That's grace. She didn't deserve it. She had done something wrong. She knew she had done something wrong. But she was in a desperate state. And, and this, this benevolent judge chose to have mercy and grace on her. And instead of punishing her and throwing her into the, to the bowels of the jail, he instead blessed her and sent her on her way. We serve a God who gives us unmerited grace. Then the last thing here, the last part, and I think this may be the hardest for us to understand, is forever. Eternity. I think that may be the hardest thing for us to understand because in our human mind, I don't think we can wrap our minds around that. There is nothing in our lives that has not had a time frame, a due date, an expiration date, a best buy date. Everything comes and goes at some point. Everything has and end. Um, everything comes to an end in this world. Now, if you talk to people from Europe, they they think that we're babies in the in New America, in uh, North America, because their history is thousands of years. And if you go to Europe, you can go to you can go to castles that have been around for six hundred years. That's only six hundred years. If you go to the Middle East, you can go to places and you can dig down and, and you can find civilizations that, that lived thousands of years ago. But that was just thousands of years ago. There was a beginning to it, and you can rediscover it now, but there was an end to it too. Nothing that you have ever experienced was forever. 
But that's what we're promised with Jesus, that we can be with him forever. I once went to a church camp with a bunch of, te- a bunch of uh, male children, and I thought that was forever. <laughs> it was a week, but it seemed like a long week. Forever. I, I, can't, I can't imagine it. I can't see it. Because nothing in my life has ever been forever. But eternity with our Heavenly Father is available to us forever. And we have never experienced that before, and we will never know that for sure until we reach the other side. But in heaven, there won't be clocks. There will be no need for watches. I noticed that Bethany was baptizing with her Apple watch on. I hope it's okay. Uh, There'd be no need for phones and and calendars. Time will no longer exist because there's, there's no end. It'll be forever. And I... Again, I just can't, I can't understand that. But I know it's going to be wonderful to be with him forever. I know that it's going to be wonderful to live in a place where we don't have expiration dates, where we don't have death and we don't have things that go bad. But we have a a time to live indefinitely forever. And God wants you to know that love that lasts forever. All right, so we've talked about relationship, provision, comfort, peace, healing, guidance, purpose, trials and testing, protection, faithfulness, assurance, deliverance, consecration, abundance, grace, security, and eternity. That's quite a bit for six verses. That's quite a bit for something that we've probably read hundreds of times ourselves. But it's all in Psalm 23. Do you accept all that he's trying to give you? Do you understand the blessing that he wants to bestow? Do you allow him to do the things in your life that only he can do? that he is striving to do? Or are you like that boy seeing the circus parade? I mean, that's enough for me. Will Ferrell had a, had a skit on Saturday Night Live back when the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire thing was, was a popular thing. And he was a, a contestant on the show. And on that show, they always ask an easy question for the first $100 and Will Farrell answered it. He said, okay, you got $100. He said, your next question. And Will Farrell interrupted and said, wait a second. Don't I have the chance to walk away with my $100? And the guy playing Regis Philbin said, of course you do. He said, well, I'm good. I'm good. You guys brought me to New York. I got to fly down here. I got a nice hotel last night. I got $100. I'm good. And while people were like throwing stuff at him, saying, you have a chance to win this money and you give it up. I think with our spiritual life, sometimes we do that. God gives us these wonderful blessings. Say, oh, that's enough, God. I'm not going to take that next step to see what else is out there because I, I'm, just, I'm just good enough here. Lord, I, I, there's so much more I know that you could explain to me, that you could, that you could expose to me, but I, I'm good. He doesn't want that for us. He wants to be able to bless us and to show us the way and to be there, be that protector, to show us that assurance, to to give us direction, to help us on our spiritual journey. If we'll allow it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together today, to hear your word. 
and to understand your blessings. Lord, you are good in all of your ways. Father, may we understand that and embrace it with our lives. And Father, I pray that you will help us as your people, Lord, to, uh, to fully uh, accept, Lord, all the things that you have for us. And may we as your people strive to live the life that you've called us to. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much again for stopping by. If you have any questions or would like to get connected here at Atlee Church, we would love to help or serve you any way that we can. And if God is doing something awesome in your life, we'd love to hear about it. You can email us directly at stories at atleychurch.org. And if you would like to support the ministries here at Atley financially, you can go to our website and click the top tab, Give, and that helps us continue to get these messages out there and make a difference in the lives of so many. Well, thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you again next week.